Hi, I'm Dr. Janet Pope at Room Now, and I'm joined by an ACR ambassador, Dr. Jeff Sparks, and we're going to talk about ACR 2020. So thanks for coming on board, Jeff. I'd like you to tell me about where the field's going with interstitial lung disease and rheumatoid arthritis, because you and others have some pretty exciting abstracts at ACR 2020. Uh, sure, and thanks for the opportunity, Janet. Um, you know, the, I think interstitial lung disease has obviously been known about a long time in rheumatoid arthritis, and it seems to be a bigger deal now. And I think it's because it's probably one of the one, few things that's not getting better with rheumatoid arthritis, despite all of our armamentarium. And what we've also found is that there seems to be a large spectrum of uh, lung abnormalities in rheumatoid arthritis. And it doesn't just seem to be parenchymal abnormalities, it also seems to be related to airways. And this is particularly intriguing since um, lung inflammation, in particular mucosal inflammation, the airways may actually be part of our RA pathogenesis where our autoantibodies are made years prior to clinical onset. Uh, so our group has really been trying to understand this, quote, respiratory burden of RA, uh, and also try to dis dissect sort of what part of the lung is affected and why is that? Um, I think the first thing people think about is maybe it's all due to smoking. Smoking is a known risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis and obviously they're bad for the lungs. Uh, so that was really the first question that we wanted to figure out is, are these manifestations really just explained by smoking? And what we found is certainly there's some explanation due to smoking, but there's really still a large part of rheumatoid arthritis lung disease that seems to be not related to that. And it's not just a parenchymal lung disease, it's also obstructive lung disease. So there's really a spectrum where patients might clinically act like they have COPD or asthma, and this could actually be a manifestation of RA. Certainly there's some patients with, that might have mild interstitial changes that aren't symptomatic, and we have to really work on trying to figure out who are the ones that progress to things that are clinically significant. So there's really a lot of work to do, and it's an exciting field. So one thing, it seems at this meeting that when you did a large study, uh, you found, I think it was a, a few three to 6%, depending on how you cut the data of interstitial lung disease, more um, UIP. Can you tell me more about that study and what the take home message might be? Sure. Well, we've been finding interstitial lung disease within our BRAS cohort here at Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, and then we've also been using other data sets. So within our BRAF cohort, we really do a lot of work to try to find, you know, really granular detail about trying to find when our ILD uh, develops and what the severity is. Uh, for this meeting, we've also branched out to looking in an administrative claims databases, which obviously have uh, advantages in numbers. Um, and we recently validated an algorithm where we're able to look at the incidence and prevalence of, of RA ILD throughout all of Medicare. Obviously, that's really the entire US over the age of 65. And what we found is that nearly 5% of patients with RA had what was validated as a clinically significant ILD. So this is not a rare issue. And that would be certainly up to my experience that I think ILD is more common than that, but clinically relevant, probably 5%. And I think of it in I realize you're going to prove me wrong in a second, but I always <laughs> used to think of it in longstanding um, strongly seropositive RF, ACPA, or both, a bit more common in men than women, and that in some people it's a long, long time, but certainly it does lead to decompensation and death. So am I thinking about it the right way, or is it incident far earlier than what I'm suspecting? Well, I think that's what our group is trying to understand and shed some light on novel risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Certainly long-standing RA and older age and smoking were really the risk factors that have been known for you know, several years. Um, and maybe the epidemiology is changing. Again, it does seem like the prevalence of ILD is, is getting worse actually with calendar time. So I think this is really a good time to try to identify new risk factors. Uh, some other abstracts have actually shown that this can happen pretty often within early RA. About half of ILD seems to occur within two years of clinical RA diagnosis. Uh, and then our group here at this meeting looked at other risk factors. We found that uh, high disease activity, high CRP, high MD hack, um, obesity. And we also found that a threshold of smoking above 30 pack years really seemed to increase the risk of um, RAILD. So if you have an RA patient who's smoking, but they haven't hit that 30 pack year threshold, that's really the time to try to get them to quit smoking.
Right. Never too late to quit. And never to, you know, early is better, of course. And mm -hmm. then I think it leads to treatment. I know at ULAR and in some recent publications, it looks like I think we can say that methotrexate does not cause or exacerbate ILD other than that acute bilateral pneumonitis, which is a different problem. However, when someone's on methotrexate and they have ILD and breakthrough, uh, I realized we're not sure what to do. So there was an abstract. Someone had that abatacept looked like a reasonable treatment. Historically, we've thought of um, uh, using rituximab and less so we kind of think that the TNFs might be a problem. So shifting gears, I certainly can say that the ILD and RA is different looking than in systemic sclerosis. In systemic sclerosis, it's usually about 15% of patients where it's clinically relevant, about double that who really actually have it. And we tend to think of it starting early and losing lung function early, and then it might level and then maybe you aspirate or have pneumonia or something happens or have a bad cold and then you lose ground again, almost stepwise. And certainly um, there are treatments that we think of such as MMF, so immune suppression, the way we think in RA and cyclophosphamide like in RA. And then Nintendinib has data both in, um, uh, significant ILD in systemic sclerosis, and then they did that other study in RA. So I think we're unraveling it, and I think your group and other groups are also uh, saving serum where possible in the BRAS cohort for genes like that MUC gene and other things. So hopefully we will have a chance of um, unraveling more and treating our patients more effectively. Well, absolutely. We're certainly learning a lot from uh, systemic sclerosis related ILD. You guys are leading the field but obviously they're different diseases, so you can't necessarily think that everything that works in systemic sclerosis will work in RA. Um, I think it really is exciting that uh, it seems like beyond MMF and rituxan that uh, abatacept certainly seems promising, but obviously you really need trials to really understand um, how to best treat these patients. It's a, tough it's a tough disease to diagnose as well, and how these medications might uh, affect risk for ILD is also up in the air. Um, there are trials ongoing about antifibrotics in RA, but certainly it would be interesting to look at, uh, you know, some of the other medications that rheumatologists often use to see whether they could help with uh, the ILD disease course. Absolutely. And we think it's quite serious, uh, an, a serious complication in both RA, which can be lethal for sure over time. And in systemic sclerosis, we have an abstract looking at um, incident population based from a claims database and in over 3000 patients with systemic sclerosis in Ontario over about the last 10 years. If you have ILD, then really your survival is only 50% as high. So you, you double your mortality over the next five to 10 years. So very serious complication of both our diseases. Yes, and our abstract in Medicare also showed around a twofold risk of total mortality, uh, even in older patients who already have a high risk from, for mortality. Uh, and then we also found the expected increased risk for respiratory mortality, but we found a novel risk factor, risk for cancer mortality. So I think that's actually going to be a, a new uh, uh, angle about how to uh, treat and manage our patients about uh, whether these patients are at risk for cancer. And it wasn't just lung cancer, I think, in your study. It was all, all cancer mortality. It was total cancer mortality, correct. That's right. Yeah. And when you adjust for smoking, who knows what will happen, but I think it still exists. It still, it still was present. So I think it's important. These patients, you know, really have a serious disease and we got a lot to do to uncover it. Well, let's hope that our fields move forward and I think they're continuing to do so. And thanks everyone, please go to uh, room now and uh, thanks for attending the ACR 2020 convergence meeting. Thank you.